life can be so mundane, can't it? We follow the same daily schedule and some endless cycle. You ever watch the movie Groundhog Day starring Bill Murray? You know, he, he uh, goes through this cycle of life. Are we having some problems with our sound here? Maybe this is not working very well. Are we good? All right. He goes through this cycle day after day, uh, uh, and, and he gets the opportunity to repeat some of the mistakes he made, and he made, and he tries to extricate himself from that endless cycle. I, I hate that movie, and the reason I hate that movie is because it's so boring watching the same scenes repeated time after time after time throughout the movie. But it's kind of a parable of life, isn't it? Because that's how life often is for us. We get up in the morning, we go to work, we come back home, we eat dinner, we relax for a few hours, we go to bed. The next day we get up in the morning and we repeat that cycle all over again. It is endlessly monotonous, day after day, week after week. We need moments of awesome in our lives, don't we? <laughs> There are a lot of ways that we can find that awesome in our lives. Let me offer you one suggestion. Chocolate. (laughs) Did you know that chocolate increases the endorphin levels in our bodies? That's the feel-good chemical in our brain. After eating chocolate, our mood and our outlook improves. Some studies have even suggested that eating chocolate improves memory function and brain activity. According to a 2012 uh, uh, edition of the New England Journal of Medicine, the countries which produce the most Nobel Prize winners are also the countries which consume the most chocolate per capita. There's a connection there, right? Obviously, chocolate is awesome. I love chocolate. My all-time favorite candy bar is Snickers, just in case any of you were wondering. (laughs) But I've recently noticed that Snickers bars are getting smaller. Have you noticed that? I actually did a little research on that, and apparently it's some kind of a health initiative that many candy makers are involved in. They have a goal to reduce the size of candy bars by next year. That's not awesome. Here is one of the new sizes of Snickers bars. It weighs about a half an ounce. In order to try to make you feel better about eating this little tiny thing, they have labeled it fun size. I don't know if you can see that on the side. It says fun size. The bar is so small, it's kind of hard to read that. Fun size. Let me tell you something. This is not fun size. This is fun size. (laughs) A one pound Snickers bar. That's awesome. (laughs) Have you seen the world record Snickers bar? It was created just last year in the Mars candy plant in Waco, Texas. It weighed in at 4,728 pounds. Here's a picture of it. (laughs) It's 12 feet long, 2 feet high, and 2 feet 2 inches wide. Now, if you were somehow able to eat that entire candy bar, you would have consumed 10 and a half million calories. Yeah, I don't care. That's still awesome. (laughs) Just think of all the endorphins it would produce. Just think of how good you would feel. Well, maybe not. (laughs) I have to admit as Christians that we don't really need chocolate. Life is already awesome, and here's why. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And that resurrection means the death of death. I've had to attend the funeral services of my two best friends, 
Joe died at age 57. He was my spiritual mentor. We grew up together. More than any other person, he is responsible for me being in the ministry. He is also responsible for me remaining faithful to my commitment to Christ. I owe so much to him. I have regrets about his death. I hadn't called him for several months before he passed away unexpectedly. He lived in southern Indiana. We'd talk occasionally on the phone, but it had been a while. From time to time in our phone conversations, he would say something like this. We need to get together. I need to come up and visit you during Pro Football Hall of Fame week. He wanted to go to the festivities. He wanted to visit the Hall of Fame. He had never been there. He wanted to see some of the football stars. He was a big football fan. And I always said something like this. Yeah, that'd be great. We ought to do that sometime. But I never made plans. Rich died at age 42. He was my spiritual ally during my final years of seminary. We lived together. We built each other. He encouraged me to read the writings of C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien, and we discussed theology and philosophy. He helped me grow intellectually. Our lives took different paths after seminary. I married and settled into a church pastorate, and he became a professional musician, and he traveled the world performing concerts. I hadn't seen him for two or three years before he died. He lived in Nashville. He had invited me down to spend some time with him, but I was busy building this church and raising a family, and I just never made the time. I have deep regrets and continuing guilt over those deaths, but I hold one firm hope, and that is that I will see those friends again because the resurrection of Jesus promises the death of death. I need that promise. I am way too familiar with death, and I hate it. I conduct too many funeral services. I do too much grief counseling. When I see an adult woman walk through the doors of this church building nearly a year after her father passed away and she's still crying, I hate death. When I wake up from yet another nightmare of my friend's death, 24 years after he passed away, I hate death. Death causes too much pain. I want death to end, and it will. For Jesus defeated death, overcoming our fear of it in the process. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 tells us we are enslaved or imprisoned by this fear of death. Since all of these sons and daughters have flesh and blood, Jesus took on flesh and blood to be like them. He did this so that by dying he would destroy the one who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And free those who were slaves all their lives because they were afraid of dying. Death is a powerful fear. We fight it. It's our greatest enemy. We spend billions of dollars annually seeking cures of all the diseases that could potentially take our lives. We want to prolong life. I have often sat by the bedside of someone in their last days or even their last hours and seen the fear on their face as they faced death. Death is a frightening enemy. We seem equally to fear aging. We spend million, billions of more dollars on reconstructive surgeries and age-defying cosmetics and youth-retaining diets and exercise programs. And it's because we know that aging is a part of the dying process. It is a visible reminder to us that death is stalking us. It's creeping up on us. It's grabbing, gripping us even tighter in its grasp. And we don't like that. When Bruce Bliven, editor of the New Republic magazine, was 80, someone asked him how it felt to be an old man. He said, I don't feel like an old man. I feel like a young man with something terribly wrong with him. He's right. That's how it feels to age. 
You see, as our bodies age, they deteriorate. That's part of the dying process. Our spirits, however, don't age, for they are eternal. Our bodies are not eternal. They do age, and we are dying daily, and it frightens us. We fear death in the dying process, and that's what makes Easter so beautiful. For the resurrection is about life. Look at the way Jesus introduced himself, described himself in Revelation 1, 18. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. He is the living Lord, the one who defeated death. He is the Lord of life. He holds the power of life in his hands. He also describes himself as holding the keys of death and the grave. Keys are symbolic of someone who is in a position of authority. The one with the keys is in authority. Jesus has authority over death because he defeated it. Did you know possums are very intelligent animals? You might not think so because... The only time we see them is when they're dead alongside the road, right? In fact, someone suggested the real reason the chicken crossed the road was to show the possum that it could be done. (laughs) But possums are considered to be very intelligent because before they enter their den, they will check all all around it for the tracks of a predator. They will inspect to see if there are tracks leading into the den. And if they see only tracks leading into the den, they won't enter. But if they see tracks leading in and then also coming out, they will know then that the den is safe and they know there's nothing to fear. The empty tomb had the tracks of Jesus leading out of it. He defeated death. He walked away from the grave. And that is awesome. Jesus defeated death, relieving our sorrow over it because we know that death separation is only temporary many of the funerals that I conduct are what I call goodbye forever ceremonies held for people who have no faith it's heartbreaking to try to minister to someone who has no belief or hope for a joyful reunion with their loved ones. There's not an awful lot that I can say to them. But Christian funerals are different. Christian funerals are, until we meet again, ceremonies. They are filled with hope, and it's because of the promise of resurrection. Let's read what the Apostle Paul wrote about the resurrected life in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. He seems to be flaunting his faith there. Especially when we read what he wrote in the next verse, in verse 55. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? He's taunting death with these words. He's able to do that with some swagger because he has a comforting confidence in life after death. And so do we. Death has been consumed By the victory of life. And it is awesome. But that's not the end of the story. Of the end of death. It gets even better. Not only did Jesus defeat death. But there will come a day when God will destroy death. I can't wait for that day when God will send death to hell. And he will. Revelation 20 tells us all about it. In that chapter, the Apostle Apostle John writes about the end of evil. For instance, in verse 9, he writes about those who are the enemies of the church. They marched around the breadth 
uh, I'm sorry, they brought march across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. He's describing there the end of the evil reign of ungodliness. We are besieged by that ungodliness now, but deliverance is coming and it will be awesome. And then in verse 10, John describes the end of Satan's reign. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning fire. Satan will be thrown into hell. Some of us imagine Satan as being the ruler of hell or maybe the punisher of hell. But that's not the case. For the rest of verse 10 tells us that he will suffer there forever. It will be the end of temptation. It will be the end of the destruction of good. It will be awesome. And then John describes the perfect trifecta when he tells us in verse 14 that it will, there will also be the end of the reign of death. Then, the, then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. So that in heaven it will be as we read in Revelation 21, 4, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. That day will be awesome. Death and the pain it brings us will be destroyed. That's the reason we are here today. That's the reason Easter is such a grand celebration. We need this assurance, perhaps more than we need any other. We have to know that there is hope on the other side of the grave, and Jesus brought that to us. But I would be remiss if I didn't conclude the message that John gave us in Revelation chapter 20. For he tells us that even though death will be destroyed, there will be a fate that is worse than death. We read about that in verse 12. When he wrote, I saw all the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what had, according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Let's leave that verse up for just a moment as we explore it. John is describing the judgment day here. He describes two sets of books. One is a singular volume. It's just called the a book or the book of life as he names it. Those whose names are recorded in that book of life are those who have been forgiven of their sins and are awarded eternal life in heaven. But then John describes another set of books, plural, think in terms of a set, perhaps of encyclopedias, many volumes. They are the books of those names recorded of people who are not forgiven of their sins and the deeds that they have committed. Those listed in that set of volumes will be judged not acceptable for heaven they have not been forgiven of their sins and verse 15 tells us of their fate anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire you may have noticed that in the previous verse we read john referred to hell as the second death it's a living death in which the unrepentant will suffer pain and anguish and the horror of death forever. There is no solution for that death after judgment. The only solution for that death is offered in the here and now. We can only find salvation from that death when we place faith in and live a life of obedience to the resurrected Lord. Easter, you see, is about hope. About your hope. Don't leave here if your future is uncertain. God wants you to have awesome, not the awful. 
Accept Jesus as your Savior. Live for him as Lord. Receive the resurrection from death to life. The Apostle Paul called Jesus' resurrection the first fruits of all those who would later be resurrected. He was the first one to experience life after death, knowing that there would be many others who would follow, and we are offered that gift. Easter isn't only about the resurrection of Jesus. It's about the hope of our resurrection as well. May that hope be yours. But know that it can only be found in a relationship with the living Lord. And he offers himself to you as your Savior this morning.